So let me start off by saying that I am no longer a competitive angler. I'm no longer a coach. And I'm really no longer a guide. I, I focus more on education than actual guided experiences. And for me, what that means is I don't need to be ready for every conceivable situation on the stream. It's just really no longer part of my job. And what that means is that there are going to be times where I'm on the water where because I don't have every single color scheme or every conceivable pattern available, I may miss out on maybe 5 6% of the time. Uh, there might be just a situation where fish are just taking a particular shade of yellow for a sulfur or a PMD, and if I don't have it, I'm okay with that, especially if that means I don't have to carry everything in the kitchen sink. So lately, when it comes to my fly tying materials and tools and even the stuff I carry with me on the stream, I am carrying a fraction, literally a fraction of what I used to carry. And I, I feel light, I feel more nimble, I feel a little bit more flexible and just less overwhelmed with the stuff that I carry on the stream and then also my fly tying tools and, and organization. So I'm okay with that. But definitely if I was competing or focusing on guided experiences where it was my job, where people were paying me to have the exact color I needed for every conceivable situation, I may be carrying a little bit more. But with that being said, we'll start off with some gear. The tools that I carry, one is, you can definitely tell some of the people, uh, the companies I'm sponsored by, but I have this Loon Silicon Map. It's great, especially when you're on a, on a nice wooden table or anytime where you're gonna be working with some glues. The other thing I like about this is especially since I tie a lot of like Euro style flies, pertagons and so forth, I'm going to be using lots of beads. Uh, some of my streamers will incorporate like pupil eyes and so forth, but there are like little indentations in here. So when this is laying flat, I can easily like lay different beads and materials on there without the idea or fear of them coming off. Also little plastic containers or like corners here so I can store hooks without fear of knocking them off onto the floor. The vices I run with these days, and I have been running with since I was 14 years old, so basically for 30 years, I've been using Regal vices. As a instructor at Penn State University, we're using vices as old as uh, vices that were bought in 2004. And these vices, the, the Regal vices, I would compare them to like a, a base model Toyota Tacoma that they're going to last you a lifetime. There's no frills and no really bells and whistles, high-end bells and whistles, but it gets the job done. I just like very few moving parts. And the thing I like about this as well is even some of the, the tools that we have at Penn State devices, I send them back to Don and Regal once in a while for repair. But these guys and girls back there will get these devices repaired and sent back to me within a week. And the vices that I'm fishing with or tying with myself, since it's just me, it's not the students that are like dropping them on the floor and so forth. Uh, I've had very little issues with them. So there's always situations where like, this is not a full true 180 degree or uh, 360 degree rotary, where maybe a full rotary would be a little bit nicer, but I just like these, it fits well. I don't have to adjust the tension when I'm going from small to large. And these are just fantastic vices and they're just built for a lifetime. And, I have no plans on ever changing manufacturers with that. So with the vices, with this, two kind of accessories I like. I do like having this little tool caddy where I'm not carrying a lot of tools, but I may have a bobbin, a uh, botkin. I may have uh, a pair of scissors or two, but if I'm worried about knocking them off on the table by leaving them on the, on the table here, I can in quickly insert them onto this table caddy or tool caddy. And probably my favorite accessory on this vise is this magnetic removable waste bucket. So what this is, is you can adjust the height of this, a little clamp goes in there. So I don't use this all the time, but especially if I'm tying like deer hair patterns or any type of material where I'm gonna be doing a lot of trimming, like on like X caddises and so forth, but like trimming deer hair, this is a, a great tool for capturing, not all, but most of the excessive materials that are coming off the fly and onto the table. This does a nice job. And then whenever I'm ready to clean it out, I just pop that off, take this over to the waste basket, basket and then dump it. But just a, a great tool. Use this 
love this, use this quite a bit. So I, as you can say, I'm sponsored by a few companies, but I love Loom products. They just, they're, they make products that are built uh, to last a long time. I like the, the bright yellow, something that's colorful, something that I can easily see. I don't really like fly tying tools that kind of bleed into my table. I, I want to be able to quickly recognize where my tools are. So this is why I, I like using a lot of the, the yellows and so forth, but tool caddies here, pretty basic. I have uh, two or three sets of scissors, two or three bobbins. Um, and when I'm doing this, especially if I'm tying like a deer hair pattern where I might be using like a six out tying thread for most of the body, and then I may be using like a gel spun, I'll have one spooled up with a gel spun, one spooled up with a regular six out nylon thread and so forth. So just a couple. I always usually have like some of my more important items. I may have two, but rarely do I have three, um, except for with scissors. Also included hair stackers. I only tie a few style of dry flies, one of them being like the X caddis, but hair stacker for that. And then also a, a wedge head pattern. I'm gonna show you some materials for, but very easy, uh, easily done. Allows me to, a larger one allows me to create larger heads on deer hair patterns. Two whip finishers, pliers. 95% of the hooks I tie with these days are barbless, but there are still some streamer hooks and other applications for using a pair of uh, pliers to crimp, but always an invaluable tool. Basically, um, this is just uh, for deer hair. So it's just a, a deer hair stacker where I can take that in there off the eye and then kind of stack and kind of pack or a, a hair packer. It allows me to create a degree of tension within the deer hair. Uh, something I use quite a bit with my wedge head patterns. Packle pliers and then a couple Velcro brushes, but that is it. All my tools that I carry with me, if I'm traveling or if I'm fishing or tying from home, every tool basically that I have or own can easily fit into this little tool caddy. Um, again, just a, a great little easily conceivable package. It allows me to store all my fly tying tools. This is another little tool caddy. I don't use this for really too many tools other than I do have some nail clippers, uh, one for hygiene, grooming, but then also for cutting wires and uh, thicker monofilaments when I'm doing like articulated patterns. Head cements, I don't carry. I don't usually use most traditional head cements. Uh, Lauren Williams from New York State, great competitive angler, just great fly tying general. Turned me on to Sally Hansen's Hard as Nails, uh, I think in 2004, 2005. And ever since then, I've been using that for my, my, basically my head cement. I also use Sally Hansen's Hard as Nails for like perlagons for the overcoating. I don't use, and I'm sponsored by a company that can provide me as much as I want, but I don't use UV products. One is, it's incredibly expensive, but then two, uh, I just, I don't react too well to it. I feel even in a very well ventilated room, I get headaches and so forth. I know Tim from Tight Lines uh, has some severe allergic reactions. I'm sure Sally Hansen's Hard as Nail Polish is not overly great for you when you're inhaling, uh, even when you're in a well ventilated room, but I just think it's a lot better than the UV products. So I, I don't use any UV products, even though it would be a lot more time um, basically a lot better for my timing uh, when it comes to tying patterns and so forth, but I don't mind the extra time it takes for that. So I just use Sally Hansen's Hardest Nail Polish. And then also for a lot of my whip finishes, I do a, a Whitlock Super Glue Splice or Whitlock Super Glue Whip Finish. Uh, but crazy glue, super glue, whatever it is, but I usually do like an industrial size container and we'll use this and this will last me close to a year. So there's that. Now let's talk about some of the essential tool or essential items material wise. So with this, I have basically all my threads, tinsels, and wires 
along with my beads and hooks for most of pretty much all my nymphs and my dry flies. So I'll show you here in a closer look a little bit more in detail about exactly how this looks, but everything from a dry fly to a nymph hook to my wires, everything here is contained within this plastic container. So let me show you a little bit more. On this container is a friendly reminder that when things don't go as planned, that it's not likely the patterns that we don't have, but maybe, just maybe, what we're doing on the water that could be the result of why we're not catching as many fish as we are. So here we are, we're gonna flip this up. So essentially I tie with two different diameters. For the most part, I have a six aught or something like a 140 denier or an eight aught or like a 70 denier. And I have this in some of your basic color schemes. I also do some fluorescence for some hot spots, some wires uh, for some of my nymph patterns. Uh, I just still use some lead wire, uh, especially on some of the, to act as a keel for some of my streamer patterns, but also if I want to put a little extra weight behind a bead on some of my Euro nymphs, I will have some smaller diameters. Uh, but here it is, when you talk about like hooks and beads, essentially, I have all my beads organized, everything from like a 1.5 millimeter all the way up to a 5.6. And when I get new packages of beads, I just basically will stick them on. So that, like with a 4.6, I don't have them arranged according to color. I will put all my 4.6s in there. And then when I'm ready to use them, I'll stick them into my hand and just pull out the colors that I want. But I don't get too wound up with color bead choice but pretty much have all my beads just here, but they are organized according to size, not color. Over here, I have all my hooks, and you'll see a D for a designation indicating a dry, but I use mostly fully mill hooks. Uh, they're a sponsor, love their products, uh, but you can do this with any, any company that you want, but I'll use everything from like a size 12 down to a 20 for most of my dry flies with that. They're light wire barbless dry fly hook. And then with the nymphs, I use their Jig Force, the uh, 5045. I don't like the, the super wide and I don't like the super long, but the 5045 pretty much takes care of everything I need. And I will use that everything from like down to a size eight for heavy jig hooks or for like jig streamers down to a 22. And with that, that pretty much covers most of my bases. There's a, a few rogue, Hook styles I will use from time to time, including like what you'll see here is a Tiemco 2032, which is kind of the um, like the grasshopper hook. I'll use that for like my stimulator drive flies. But right here is essentially like most a lot of my Pertigone style patterns and so forth. Um, I might have some tinsel in here to tie some variations of the Rainbow Warrior. But this is it: hooks, beads, threads, everything all organized to go into one container and nowhere else. So let me show you some of the actual materials that I'm using here as well. And I kind of organize this all in Ziploc baggies. Some of them are just materials, general materials clumped into one bag. But then I also have baggies that are essentially kits. Uh, there are some patterns I will just tie. Like I said, only a handful of patterns I will tie. For example, uh, like a scalp snack, which is just my variation of a, a woolly bugger, one of 20 million variations of a woolly bugger. I will have this all marked, but everything I need to tie the sculpt snack other than the beads and the hook is right here. Uh, feathers, uh, chenille, rubber legs, everything ready to go. So I have the sculpt snack. Getting more into a few of the game changers, especially the, like, the feather and like the hybrid changer. Uh, I don't use these patterns a lot. I think, again, I think a lot of the game changers are overkill for my trout waters, but where I, whenever I get into places where I feel like the fish really take an extra time or extra second to look at your pattern, uh, some of the tail waters I fish, especially like with bass, which really tend to eat the fly more on the paws or on the hang. A pattern like the feather game changer has just lots of great movement but it has lots of movement more importantly after the stop after you get done with the, the strip or the retrieve the fly just hangs there but it continues to move so it's just a an extra selling point 
and I use pretty much a lot of the game changers for slow water bass and for some of my trout fishing on tailwaters. And I just tie this in a couple different color schemes, mostly white, as you can see here. When it comes to musky, I will, I will buy a few musky flies from some friends, but one of the, the main patterns that I use now, and pretty much the pattern I use like 95% of the time uh, this season and what I expect moving forward, is just Joe Goodspeed's uh, goop head pattern. I used to buy these from a friend who could tie them, but then I just figured out how to tie them myself. But I have basically the shanks, everything I need to go right here. We will switch into the dry flies, stimulator, X hair, X hair caddis, or X caddis, uh, dry fly pack, but deer hair has all the antron material I need. Most of the deer hair I get, or hair I get for my X caddis, I get directly from Blue Ribbon Fly Shop in West Shellstown, Montana. Uh, Bucky and that whole crew, I mean, there's some other places in the country that have like really good quality deer hair, but the stuff at Blue Ribbon Fly Shop is just top notch and just fantastic people and just a, a group of individuals I'm very happy to support. Uh, Wedgehead, going back to streamers again, Matt Verlack, uh, someone who I've, I've learned so much from, uh, a Michigan angler, guides for Gates Lodge, uh, has a, a variation of a Wedgehead, deer hair fly, a neutral buoyant with dumbbell eyes, but probably one of my favorite articulated patterns. Uh, I use pretty much anywhere in the country. And I just, I have this kit set up to tie maybe three, maybe four color variations of his wedge head. But it's here, everything other than the beads and the hooks or the dumbbell eyes. Another one, the Murdoch Minnow, just uh, for bass. I don't use it for trout nearly as much. I don't know why, there's no reason I don't, but the Murdoch Minnow is simple, effective, easy to tie, and just absolutely deadly. I will tie this in like basically two colors for bass. Chartreuse, like Lefty says, if it ain't chartreuse, it ain't no use. And white, the Murdoch Minnow. Little Crelix pattern, uh, just flash material. I get this from Eastern Trophies. You can buy the smaller singular packs from fly shops. And it's okay, but you're going to be paying an arm and a leg for like a small little package. I get this directly from, I think his name's Bob, uh, but from Eastern Trophies. But just, I'll buy the large hanks of this and a couple color schemes for 20 bucks. You can get close to a, a couple of years supply worth right here. So I tie this in a couple different colors. I, I think this is called the coffee scheme. Some gold and some silver, but pretty much like three color schemes of the Crelix. Just a... A great pattern from uh, an amazing innovator uh, of, of our time, Chuck Kraft. What else do we got here? And then also, of course, I mean, if you're trout fishing, you need to have some junk flies. So uh, it's proportionately, it's disproportionate to the number of other materials I use for trout. But uh, I, I will use uh, a couple of color schemes on the mop orange like kind of like a kind of a brighter orange and a chartreuse in my two favorite colors i may have like a tan maybe like a brown one in there but pretty much chartreuse and orange i will have materials like the ecstasy material i tie this in like a, maybe three or four color schemes but the ecstasy pattern also some material for green weenie like chartreuse and along with some squirming worming material, also in some co different color schemes, but whether you like it or not, junk flies just work. And it does, it's not just for tr stock trout. These work just as well, sometimes better for wild and native fish species. So I will tie this. Uh, I will have always a bag of junk flies with me. Some other things I will have with me, just a couple of random colors. So over the last couple of years, maybe it's a few nymph patterns, uh, maybe a few X, X caddis patterns, but it's pretty much just a, a small supply of dubbings uh, and colors that I like for probably much 95% of the nymphs and dry flies I tie. So this is it, all the, the dubbings I need for my nymphs and my dry flies, I've kind of pared down to exactly what you see there. Some tailing material, including 
Pheasant Tail and Cote d'Elion. Cote d'Elion, I have this in a couple different shades, but I bought these skins when I was working for TCO Fly Shop back in 2006, 2007. Bought a couple um, complete uh, skins and these have been lasting me for, and I do tie quite a few flies, so this will last me probably the rest of my life. And then I just got done doing or working on a podcast with Matt Sapinski, the Howl Water podcast. We talk about the pheasant tails. You want to talk about a pattern that I just can't get enough of, uh, Frank Sawyer's pheasant tail. I, I tie a very simple version of his pattern called the simple pheasant tail, but I will get use mostly natural materials, but I may use some olive or some black uh, for some color variations. But pheasant tail nymphs are a mainstay our main, main, basically a main pattern uh, within my nymphing box. So Coke de Leon, some color, different colors of pheasant tail, covers most of my bases. Do have a few hackle patterns. I don't tie a whole lot with dry fly hackles. There are some stimulators and maybe some old traditional cat skills and some parachute patterns. Most of the patterns now I tie for dry flies are done with CDC. So I have my pack of CDC. I get uh, the Foley Mills CDC or any material close to that for most of my dry flies. So I tie that on a couple of varieties of colors. Some foams. Uh, these are usually foam bodies for ants, foam bodies for beetles. Also some uh, larger foam sheets for a couple color variations of chubby Chernobyls. All my foams right there. Uh, the catnip or the chewy cas, whatever you want to call it, but just a very simple pattern I like to tie. I have some little micro straggle, straggle chenille right here, a couple different color schemes. Really good pattern for that. Also a small little select pattern of basically some materials I use for like the rubber late stonefly, Spencer Haga's SOS. I have some of the black rubber or the, the black flat, uh, flash of material for that. I have some micro black legs for the wet ant, but that's pretty much it. Uh, keeping everything fairly organized. Last but not least, I do have uh, some streamer hooks. Not as well organized, but I will tie this in everything from like a like a size six all the way down to like a, a three out or a four out for some of my more larger predator style patterns. Also a small container, uh, some excessive some excess streamer hooks along with cone heads and dumbbell eyes. But that is it. Everything that you see here, uh, fly time wise, I can easily move in and out. There was a time in my life when I had, and that's, I would watch videos of like Larry Dahlberg and go to my mentor's house, Joe Humphreys, and just see walls full of fly time materials. And I thought, man, that's exactly what I want. And then after maybe 15, 20 years of that, I figured out that's exactly what I don't want. There are some people that love controlled chaos that are just absolute fly tying geniuses that just thrive with just all kinds of materials and so forth. But the bandwidth between my ears is much lower than theirs. Uh, so I, I sort of thrive and do better in, the vir in an environment that is a lot cleaner and a lot more simplified. So this right here allows me keep things nice, neat, and orderly. And then when I'm tying flies, I can bring this out and there's only a handful of patterns I'm gonna be tying. So I know exactly where it's at, I can get to it. And then when I'm done, I put it back the exact same day. It takes a little bit of time thinking about this, about organizing it. You know, as Yvonne Chouinard once said, that probably the most difficult thing you can do is simplify your life, or in this case, simplify your fly tying materials. But it's been a few years, it's taken me to get to this point, but it's something that has made my life a lot easier and less uh, of a mess. So I hope this helps. And I may might be doing something similar to the way I organize my trout, bass, and musky gear. And maybe even a further step further into my boats and how I keep my boats clean and organized and keep things running uh, without, uh, without a loss. So that is it. Thank you for watching and Happy New Year. Take care.